Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Evans. I'm with the Meridian Chamber of Commerce. And um, we're here today uh, in partnership with the City of Meridian, Central District Health, Crush the Curb Idaho, and numerous partner organizations and individuals as we share with you a program that will assist Meridian businesses as they reopen. Our campaign is designed to educate businesses on the basic guidelines to reopen based on Central District Health and CDC guidelines. It will allow businesses to demonstrate to the public that they're doing so in a manner that will keep Meridian healthy and open for business. Online and speaking with us today are just a few of the partner or partners and organizations that have helped develop this program to support the Meridian business community, as well as local area businesses leading in best practices when it comes to safely reopening. Joining us today are Amber Evans with Central District Health. Uh, we have Amy Stahl with Salter Health, Crush the Curve Idaho. And we have Sam Dorries with uh, Extra Mile Arena that we'll be speaking uh, shortly. We will open it up for questions at the end of the presentation, and you can enter your questions anytime during the presentation in the question window. The premise behind our campaign was getting businesses back open and restarting our economy. And this is why our group was started. We initially pursued efforts to get everyone open as early as possible, but we also saw the bigger issue of businesses might face when reopening amidst the COVID-19 crisis, and that was, will the public return to the stores, establishments, or facilities when they reopen? We're contacted daily by our business members on how the governor's plan applies to their business. When can I reopen? And what are the actual guidelines my business needs to follow? While the Meridian Chamber of Commerce is not an authority on the plan or the recommended guidelines, we are here to help Meridian businesses understand them better. The last thing we want to happen is our local businesses is they go to the effort and the expense to open, bring back employees, restock their shelves, and the public, the consumers, not visit their establishment out of the fear or concern for their safety. The Central District Health and CDC have developed some guidelines to reduce your risk when out in public. And if businesses can follow these guidelines as they reopen and demonstrate to the public that they're serious about public safety and health, then that will help build consumer confidence necessary to restart our economy. The Meridian Chamber of Plumbers has launched the Keep Meridian Healthy and Open for Business campaign to help businesses build that consumer confidence. As businesses open, according to the governor's four-stage Idaho Rebounds program, we'll assist those businesses by conducting industry-specific webinars like this one that will provide information from Central District Health and CDC on basic guidelines for that industry, and the webinars will also feature local business leaders that have taken even further steps to ensure that they're reopening in a safe and responsible way. After businesses participate in a webinar for their industry, they'll be provided free of charge collateral material that they can display in their store that recognizes them as participating in the Keep Meridian Healthy and Open for Business campaign. These materials include door signage that shows they're a part of the campaign, posters for in-store display that touch on all of the things they need to be doing in order to keep their customers and employees healthy. Also includes social media material to share online to demonstrate that they are following the guidelines and uh, keeping their, their patrons and customers uh, safe and healthy. Participating businesses will also be listed uh, on our website and included in our marketing campaign as businesses that are doing uh, above and beyond to try and help keep Meridian healthy and open for business. The guidelines out there are not a one size fits all solution for every business. We don't know what we don't know. These industry specific webinars seek to educate beyond a sheet of written guidelines. To be in compliance with the governor's four stage business uh, openings, we will only provide the collateral materials when the business is scheduled to open according to the governor's plan. Also following up after opening, the participating businesses will be encouraged to answer surveys from the Meridian Chamber on how their opening is going and the sentiments from their patrons returning to the stores and businesses. This will assist us in phase two of our program as we build out business revitalization teams to support area businesses. Please look to the keepmeridianhealthy.org website for a complete listing of uh, industry-specific webinars what you see here is what we have scheduled for this week, 
and watch the replays from previous webinars that we've conducted over the last two weeks. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Amber Evans with Central District Health to share with you some guidelines for uh, our topic today, industry, uh, for large venues uh, that are be reopening in the coming weeks. Amber? All right. Thank you, Sean, and thank you for the Meridian Chamber of Commerce for having me today. I look forward to educating you guys on everything that I have today. So our biggest concern with the um, stage four opening theaters and larger venues is large crowds of people. That is how coronavirus spreads is through droplet, through breathing other people's air. So when you think about concerts, you think of crowded halls news you think about people packed together in the stadiums and so what we're really focusing on is pop providing information to the um uh, how do i say this to your patrons um posting signage saying like reminding them to stay home if they're ill um practice um, recommended social distancing for so example movie theater you could have families buy their tickets in groups and then have them separated based on how um how many groups you have so we'll have seats set open in between them um you could also encourage wearing cloth face masks it's not required just to remind you but it is recommended but not only by us but by the um, cdc um, we also would like to talk about controlling the flow of traffic. So in these larger venues, make sure there's only one way in, one way out. People aren't going back and in, back and forth in different areas. And also increasing the sanitation of high touch surfaces, such as um, ticket counters, um, concession stands and bathrooms, and making sure those areas where people are the most exposed to this virus are being clean. Um, these are some of the top guidelines we have. As far as concerts go, we would probably recommend not allowing people to be crowded in the front during, say, the musician's performance, having seats set up and then having them stay in those areas. I know it's hard to do, especially when you're at a concert, say at Extra Mile Arena, and there's some big names coming in through, but we want to keep people safe so that we don't have to revert back to stage three or even stop stage four. Um, we also would like to ensure that there's hand sanitizer if you're able to supply hand sanitizer for your um, uh, patrons and that making sure your staff understands like even if they are sick, they can stay home too. And these are some of the key things that we are really focusing on and we would just always like to reiterate, we just want to make adjustments for close proximity. So like if there's group together like I said seating them all together in one movie theater or for example in the arena having that group all seated together it will limit the, limit the amount of people that are in these venues but we want to keep people safe and that is what I have for you guys we will have a document up for you before stage four but we do not currently because we are just beginning the stage two Sean do you have any questions for me uh, Amber, if you wouldn't mind staying on till the uh, end of the program, and I, I do see some questions popping in, so we'll get to those when, we're, when we when uh, we get through with the presentations here. Perfect. Next up. Uh, next up on our agenda is um, Amy Stahl with Salter Health, Crush the Curve, Idaho. While it's not required at this time for employees to return to work, one of the most important factors that have been outlined all along is the importance of testing and tracing to slow the uh, spread of the virus. Joining us today to talk about the availability of testing in the Treasure Valley is Amy Stahl. Amy? Thank you, Sean. I want to commend the Meridian Chamber for taking the initiative to uh, host these webinars specific to various industries. I think it's really valuable for businesses to hear information that pertains particularly to them. I am speaking to you as a representative um, of Crush the Curve from Salter Health. We are the medical partner to Crush the Curve Idaho. Uh, we do the testing at sites in the Treasure Valley for PCR and antibody testing. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the testing process and explain what Crush the Curve Idaho is. If you are not familiar with Crush the Curve Idaho, we are a group of business leaders led by our CEO, Tommy Alquist, that quickly mobilized around the need to have more testing kits available so that we could find out more information about um, who has the virus, who has the antibodies, 
and collect more data um, around that to help uh, advance uh, the workplace opening and the governor's guidelines. Uh, PCR testing you may be familiar with uh, is nasal testing. Uh, we are doing that in uh, several locations. Most notably, we have drive up PCR testing at the two Salter Health Urgent Care Clinics in North and South Nampa. We're also doing it at the uh, temporary 10 mile location at 10 mile crossing at 10 mile and I-84. We are testing symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, people at that site. Uh, we have a team of um, clinical people doing the testing. The results are shared on a secure patient portal um, that is accessible only to you. The IgG antibody testing uh, is also occurring at the 10 mile location. That is a simple blood test. The results are also shared on the secure patient portal and it is a partnership with the University of Washington Virology Department. Uh, last, uh, we want, I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of how you as an employer, if you're interested in either of these tests, it is available to you by going to crushthecurveidaho.com, filling out um, a simple form, and our team at Salter Health will help you schedule those tests for your employees. The cost, uh, we will help you uh, bill your insurance. The, however, you will be responsible for any unreimbursed costs. The current costs for the tests are about $95 for PCR testing and about $100, $105 for the IgG antibody testing. So you'd need to be prepared from a budget standpoint for that. I will stay on the call for more questions uh, and appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, Amy. Really appreciate the uh, the partnership with Crush the Curve Idaho and, and Salter Health. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, I wanna uh, mention again, uh, the City of Meridian and their efforts. Uh, the, the City of Meridian passed an ordinance uh, or a, a, some guidance uh, that waives three permit fees to help businesses reopen and prosper um, amidst the, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, some businesses, uh, venues and things are looking for ways to uh, expand uh, their operations to uh, conform to social distancing uh, rules and regulations. So the City of Meridian has waived the fees for alcohol catering permits, temporary use, promotional sales use permits, and limited duration sign permits. You still have to apply for those permits, but there are no fees between now and through the end of December. So uh, thank you for the City of Meridian for uh, supporting uh, the business community on that. With that, I'd like to introduce Sam Dorries. Uh, Sam is the Director of Business Operations for Extra Mile Arena. Uh, some of the uh, most creative things are being done by our, our businesses here in the Treasure Valley on opening safely and uh, being, trying to get things back to uh, some form of normalcy. Sam, would you mind sharing with us some of the things that Extra Mile Arena is doing? Uh, as far as best practices. Yes, and, and I appreciate you having me, Sean, and, and thank you for letting us um, take part in this conversation. I think it's really important for us to be a part of the conversation. We really want to make sure that other local businesses and our guests and our fans know what we're doing and what we're um, what we're thinking through as we plan to reopen. And, and for us, you know, the arena hosts over 100 events a year and 300,000 guests annually. And um, and that's a combination of a bunch of different events, obviously the bigger, flashier concerts and entertainment events, but we also host 40 Boise State Athletic Games. We host 15 university and high school commencements and graduations. Um, and so for us, you know, getting back to normal isn't just to just to open our doors again and be back into business. For us, it's bringing everybody back together. It's, and it's doing it in a, a safe and healthy manner. You know, we want to be able to have everybody back together singing and watching their favorite teams play and walking across the stage as graduates. But we know we have to be um, we have to be smart and responsible in doing so. Um, you know, I'd say that we our overall approach, kind of going into the planning process, was was the idea and the notion that we have to get this right. We Getting this right is more important than just getting it done. Um, and we have to get it right. And so for us, it meant, 
and it continues to mean it, you know, we can't be impulsive. We can't cut corners. Um, we can't open tomorrow just because we really, really want to, if we're not ready to do so, you know, we, as the arena, we have a responsibility and duty of care to our guests, um, to our staff, to our clients, to the university and community as a whole, really, to do everything we can to ensure the health and well-being of anyone that comes into the arena. And, and we do take that seriously. And so for us, as we've been planning and going through this process, that's kind of been the overarching, um, kind of that overarching mindset. Getting it right is more important than just getting it done. And so kind of going into what our plan is incorporating um, and what's in our plan. And, and I will say we have a we have a ton of really, really good people working on this plan right now. Um, truly, our entire staff from top to bottom has um, has contributed, and, and it is a huge team effort and a huge team undertaking because it everything we're doing is touching every single department, everything from security and guest services to housekeeping to marketing to production. It, it truly um, – it's going to involve all of us in, in our efforts. And so, you know, the first part of what we're kind of what our reopening plan is, um, is addressing is the notion to inspire confidence. And I think we've all heard that phrase often that we need to inspire confidence amongst the guests and uh, the people coming to our venue. And, and ours takes that a little bit further. We also need to inspire the confidence of the university, of the NCAA, of our clients and of our staff, both our full-time staff and our part-time staff. And, you know, this plan isn't geared just towards our guests. We we obviously need to inspire them so that they feel comfortable coming back. Um, we also need to inspire the, the confidence of our full and part-time staff, our vendors, our contract labor, uh, and, and really everyone that's going to step into the building in, in one way or another. And so as we get closer to reopening, our message is really going to be geared to all of those groups and not just the fans and and for us that messaging is is super critical and super important we want to include detailed information of our plan to inspire that confidence um you know so people understand what we're doing and uh and what we will do once doors reopen the next kind of part that's uh that's making up our plan is just all of the guidelines we've ta we've drawn from a lot of inspirations obviously we're keeping a close eye on local, state, and government health and safety authorities. There are obviously some overarching similarities amongst them, but they'll vary. So we're making sure to keep an eye on those and constantly looking at them. We know that all of that's changing daily, um, hourly, sometimes even quicker, it feels like. But um, for us, we're, we know that this plan is going to incorporate that those best guidelines from the CDC, from the Central Health District, and but that the plan is going to be flexible. It's a living, adaptable document, and we're we're building flexibility into that plan um, to address situations as they come up. We're also taking uh, we're also taking guidance from IABM, which is the International Association of Venue Managers. I happen to serve as the vice chair of the Arena Committee for IABM, and so we're involved in a lot of town halls. They put together a lot of committees and task force, and they're plan is it's going to be probably a good 60 or 70 pages that really talks about you know now that we have these guidelines from all the various entities what is that how does that actually play into practice what is the operator of a venue whether it be an arena stadium a performing arts center you know how do you actually put that into practice and so we're incorporating some of that information from IBM there's another local industry Group Event Safety Alliance that we're pulling information from. They just recently um, they just recently put out their 30-page reopening plan that again talks about these guidelines and the safety and health and well-being of all of our fans and guests. And so we're drawing heavily from inspiration from that. The university has several subcommittees as well, so they're looking at reintegration, disinfection protocols, social distancing standards training, um, positive case ma management, contractor protocols, et cetera. They're, they're following the American College Health Association guidelines, which looks at a number of considerations for higher education. So we're working in coordination with the university to incorporate their philosophies and protocols into our plan. And, um, you know, I'd say one of the, one of the more exciting things we're actually working with right now is a industrial hygienist company, which, um, doesn't scream exciting off the top of the off the top of the page, but it's really cool. We're we're working with them to 
they're providing a number of recommendations on the necessity of using only CDC approved chemicals, um, ongoing ATP testing, which helps assess the level of our efficiency in manning or cleaning effectiveness, um, statistical process controls, increase in staffing, and a number of standard operating procedures. So we're putting all that together, we're putting standard operating procedures for training our housekeeping staff for day-to-day -day cleaning, pre, during, and post-event cleaning, and remediation if there is actually a positive test in the arena. Um, and so we're really excited to be working with them right now. We're, we are, we've are we had a couple of meetings with them already and kind of pulling everything together as we speak, but the information that we get from them is gonna be super value and it's going to really take our, our housekeeping team to a whole new level. You know, it's, it's worth mentioning that for a long time in our industry in, in a large venue or for games and concerts and events that the housekeeping team is typically in the background, you know, they're they're usually wearing black shirts and black pants and cleaning in the dark when guests aren't seeing them. They've never been a, a visible aspect of what we do, but they are moving forward. They're gonna be obvious and visible and people are going to want to see the efforts being made. And so part of our plan is going to address that as well to say, how do we ensure that our housekeeping team, who is now our front line of defense in this effort, uh, are visible and are out there for everyone to see. We've put together, we've really gone top to bottom on all of our policies and procedures related to everything we do, screening and scanning, concessions, guest services, guest flow, event cleaning, um, protective equipment, load in, load out. We're, we kind of took a top to bottom approach on identifying the most reasonably foreseeable risks in, in keeping people safe and um, accounting for their well-being. And so, once we've identified these risks, we're now trying to figure out how to best mitigate them. And so it truly is everything that we do, every touch point, every department, um, you know, some of the highlights of what we're doing are um, temperature checks and protective equipment for employees. We're identifying how can we make six foot queue lines at our entries, at the box office, at the concession stands in the restrooms, you know, how do you, it's obviously a tight space for those who have been to the arena. Our, our concourses are a little tight. Our restrooms are a little tight. And, you know, it's going to take some effort, but we're going to ensure that there's that proper space to do so. We're looking at longer load-in time so that guests have just more time to come in. So not everyone is crammed at the doors that hour before. Um, you know, how do we manage guests with symptoms? How do we incorporate um, and make adjustments to how our staff get checked in and briefed? And so we're putting all of these policies together right now, and um, they're going to become a part of our, our code of conduct and become part of our general policies and prohibited items. And it's going to make it easier for us to enforce, no different than we would force, um, you know, if someone was overly intoxicated. These are all going to be part of the fabric of what we do moving forward. Um, and and I would say probably the last part of what our plan is is the. Um, the actual seating maps themselves, which is obviously super important. We are working on a variety of layouts depending on the type of event, um, whether it's general admission or ticketing, whether it's a sports event or a concert, um, whether we anticipate there not being any fans or unlimited amount of fans or full fans. And so again, kind of speaks to the flexibility that's needed in our plan, but we're prepared for a variety of scenarios and, um, and we'll do so in a manner that is, um, safe and consistent with these best industry practices that we've talked about, but we, we have a, a number of different seating plans and seating options that we can deploy based off what's needed for that particular event. And so, you know, I think I can, I can say without a doubt in my mind, at least that, that our arena is going to be safer and cleaner than ever before, which, um, which is actually pretty high praise. We, we have very well regarded policies in those areas right now. We get compliments from, staff, guests, clients all the time about just our general safety and health and well-being practices that we have now, but we're going to take it to another level. Um, and it's exciting. We're, we're excited to take it up a notch. We're excited to have people back in the building. And, you know, I know it's, um, it's a difficult time for a lot of people and we're excited to, to help play our part and bring everybody back together. Obviously, 
in a safe and, and healthy manner, but we're excited that the show at some point is going to go back on and we're hopeful that that's sooner rather than later. And, you know, we're putting these plans in place to do so. So I, um, you know, I know it's kind of a high level overview. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions on this call, but also I'm happy to, to send out my contact information or, or have Sean send out my contact information. Anyone's welcome to send me an email. I'm, I'm uh, on it often these days, of course, and, and happy to help answer questions or provide any other information that I can. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we will definitely uh, take you up on the questions here. I've got a few that have popped in. So uh, with that, I'd like to kind of uh, open it up for questions. Uh, remember, you can enter your questions in the question box, the chat box, and we will get to those. Um, Sam, a lot of the questions are specifically for you uh, and sure. Extra Mile Arena. Um, one of the first questions is, what are you seeing from artists and shows as far as scheduling over the next three months? What, I mean, you've probably seen cancellations, but what are you hearing from artists and, and other shows? Yep, it's um, a great question. One we talk about every single day. We, we at least in the arena, um, the first show that we still have on the books, which certainly could change tomorrow or by the time I'm off this call is at the end of July. So for sure we won't have anything in May, for sure we won't have anything in June. Um, everything's either being postponed or pushed back until at least that end of July and, and truly into August and September. I think that there are, I was actually on a call last night, there are some tours that are that are planning on going out on July 1st um, and that those may or may not come through uh, Idaho, of course, but the artists want to come back. There are certainly artists that can um, can afford, for lack of a better word, can afford to sit out for the rest of the year and not play at all until 2021. Some of the more well-known and, and high-level artists, but there's a, a huge amount of that kind of middle tier and different level of artists that want to come back. And so we are looking at ways to do that in the arena and we're looking at ways of doing it outside the arena. Can we get creative and can we do something in the next couple months until we can actually get back inside that, um, that still provides that level of entertainment. Uh, you mentioned you're working on uh, plans uh, for capacity and seating and things like that. Are, do you have any anticipation of what the capacity guidelines will be? Will it be 50%, 25% of your normal capacity? Um, it just seems kind of strange going to a, a concert that usually is sold out and, and packed and now uh, sitting that far away from, from groups. I, I think strange is the best word for it. Um, it it's going to depend a little bit on the on the, the map and what we do, because we're looking at a, some of the different things we're looking at, I guess, are is if you have one person seated and then six feet and then one person and then six feet or is it in groups of two or three or four? Um, you know, across the industry, I would say most venues are looking at, um, you know, major capacity reduction, 75% of their capacity gone because of this. And so I think we're going to try and get creative where we can, but I, I do think it means that typically we have 12,000 people, we can fit 12,000 people in the venue, but I do think that that number um, becomes just a couple of thousand pretty quickly, depending on how it's, um, how it's interspersed and for some events that's not going to be an issue you know we could host uh, a graduation tomorrow with with that proper social distancing we could host a basketball game potentially um, and so it, it some of it's going to take some getting used to I, I I'm hopeful that that's a short-term fix that's a six months fix or an eight or ten months fix but that um, that we get to full normal capacities sooner rather than later Sam, you touched on this a little bit by making the comment that you're, you know, possibly making your sanitation teams more visible uh, to instill consumer confidence. Some businesses are closing their public restrooms. I know that can't happen in your venue, but what are you looking at as far as some additional guidelines for cleaning restrooms and things like that during a show instead of uh, at your, your previous cycles? Sure. Yeah. And, and that's uh, that's obviously a super important focus right now, both in the restrooms and outside the restroom. So even just starting outside the restrooms, you know, part of what our housekeeping team will be is kind of 30 minutes before doors open, they'll go around and, and hit all the high touch point areas, whether that's doorknobs, door handles, stairwell rails, um, 
the elevator, et cetera, you know, those kind of high touch points, they'll hit right before doors open. So they'll be ready to go right away. And then they'll make those paths basically every 30 minutes during a show or an event um, on those high touch point areas. And then in the restrooms in particular, we're looking at a variety of things. One is, you know, do we, do we close off every other stall? And so that gives the proper spacing. We, we will likely put down kind of social distancing placards and things on the ground so that people are coming in and out of the restroom properly. Luckily, we, you know, some venues we've talked to only have one way in and one way out of their restrooms, which luckily we are not in that position. So we have the ability to control the flow a little bit. We're switching all of our sinks, um, soap dispensers, toilet or um, paper towel dispensers. We're swapping everything out to uh, touchless so that that's going to minimize the touch points in the restrooms for everybody. And that's going to make that process that much easier and um, more sanitary. We've, um, we're outfitting and, and actually working through some uh, iterations right now on plexiglass and other barrier shields that would go in between the sinks. Right now, obviously, all of our sinks are kind of elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder. And so we're looking at um, what the right product will be to separate those so that we don't have to close any of those off. What we don't want to do, where we can at least, obviously, is we don't want to make the experience longer and make it worse for everybody. We um, you know, we know that people are still going to have to go to the bathroom. People are still going to have to buy concessions. And so we're looking, even with concessions, we're looking at, are there ways that, um, people can order their food as part of when they buy their ticket, you know, can they order their food when they get there and just pick it up? Are there ways that can minimize those lines and, and still give them a good guest experience? And I, and I actually think it's a little unique way of thinking. I think there's actually some really good positives that are going to come out of this and, you know, I know it's tough to think in that manner because there's just a lot of difficult things that are happening and change is difficult and it's going to cost money to to do those changes. But we're really excited, actually, that some of the policies and procedures that we're going to be able to put into place um, are going to be kind of long term solutions that are actually make coming to a, an event at the arena even better, whether, you know, whether this makes it more efficient or. Um, easier to do this or easier to do that. We're actually really excited that there's going to be some really good positives to come out of that. Um, so I think I answered the question. I know I took it, <laughs> I yep. took it roundabout. I apologize, but uh, well, and you you touched on the next question a little bit. So this one may be for Amber and you. Uh, are there some specific food service guidelines for venues, especially ones that have self service items like the condiment, paper? Uh, products and things like that. How, Amber, do you recommend that they change those policies, procedures? And uh, Sam, what are you all doing at Extra Mile Arena? Amber? Um, excellent question. We actually got this from quite a few restaurants during the stage two reopening. We are recommending that um, either the food handler provides the condiments for the person, ask them like, how much cash do you want, how much must you want, or if that's not a viable option for you to probably purchase the small disposable packets. Just because um, those condiment stations can just be a risk of exposure, especially if multiple people are reaching into it, even with a sneeze guard, it would still possibly be a risk. So what we're asking people is to possibly look into alternate solutions for this. And yeah, what, I would what say are you we're doing, doing Sam? I was gonna say we're yeah, I think we're doing the same exact thing. Um, you know, having the person behind the counter provide condiment packages, having them provide little cups of jalapenos or onions, having them provide the, the utensils, um, and really even just relooking at our food menu in general. We're we're going to switch to more prepackaged options. People are gonna be a little more leery of um, you know, eating the pretzel or, or popcorn that our food service to staff, even if they're wearing gloves and masks and all the proper equipment, they're going to be a little more leery of that. So we're looking at um, what types of prepackaged options there are and making sure that there's good options, healthy options, vegetarian options, all sorts of different options. Um, we work with Aramark as our first food service provider. So we've been in touch with them and working through kind of what that menu would look like, but, um, but doing all those same things that you mentioned, Amber. Okay. Um, Amber, you touched on it briefly earlier when you were talking about theaters, and I know we don't have anyone from the theater industry on the call today, but um, last, a week ago, whenever we had the Village of Meridian on there, they did mention that uh, as theaters have moved towards designated seating, they now have the technology to limit the seats 
available. Uh, to your point, and maybe to answer the question about uh, grouping, Amber, social distancing between individuals or in, in between parties, what is the recommendation? So what we're recommending, similar to what we're doing with our sit-in dining, is that there is six to ten feet between groups of people. So if you were there, say, with your family, you would want at least six feet between you and the other person. Um, we're not so much worried about the back of your head, like when you're sitting in the theater, because you're not like the wall. The, what we're really worried about is a droplet exposure. But um, we're more worried about the space in between. So if like, say you go to see Wonder Woman, 1984, that's a new movie that I know is coming out. Um, you and three or four friends go together, you would want to be doing it as a group. And hopefully that the village and even the Majestic here in Meridian are willing to accommodate that or have a way for you to have a code where everyone in your group can purchase their tickets separately, but you type in like a three digit number or a three digit code so that they know which group you're part of so they can space you out evenly. Okay, excellent. Um, Last question I've got here is, you know, one of them that's a very touchy subject. How do you anticipate enforcing social distancing guidelines with all the patrons, uh, especially whenever you're looking at, you know, maybe a venue that uh, has hundreds of people at it? Um, how, how do you anticipate enforcing those, Sam? Yeah, I think that's a good question and, and something that is going to be difficult. Um, but we're going to look at it like uh, like all of our other policies and procedures. You know, we enforce that people can't get overly intoxicated. We enforce that people can't bring a gun into the venue. And so, you know, whichever policies we land on and and relay to the public, we're going to enforce those no different than any of our normal policies, prohibited items, code of conduct, um, and and go through the same process we would if it were if we're someone trying to bring a gun in or someone trying to stand too close to the person behind them, you know, well, our guest services staff and security staff are, are very good at having those conversations and enforcing those rules. And, and we'll do the same uh, for whichever new policies we come out with as well. Okay. Excellent. Um, I don't see any other questions in there. So with that, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today and please help spread the word to all area businesses that we're here to help them open in a safe, responsible way and want to keep Meridian healthy and open for business. Be sure to answer your follow-up survey we'll be sending out uh, to your email and collateral materials are available now uh, for those that are in the, the proper stage. Visit keepmeridianhealthy.org for more information on this program and sign up for future webinars. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Amy, for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. Have a wonderful week and keep Meridian healthy and open for business. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. And thanks you, Sam. And Amy, thank Absolutely. you.